This is Audiovisual Cultures, the podcast exploring sound and image-based cultural production. I'm your host, Paula Blair. This week, Andrew Shale and I take on Get Out. If this is the first time you're joining us, a very warm welcome. You can find all our previous episodes on the podcast page of the website at audiovisualcultures.wordpress.com. If you listen regularly and can spare a couple of quid a month, pledge support via patreon.com to sustain and improve this work and to help us reach wider audiences. We're very grateful for all financial support as well as listens, shares and likes on social media. I'll be back at the end with further ways of keeping in touch. For now, enjoy the discussion. Well, Christy Smith, you set down a gauntlet and we have attempted to pick it up. Christy challenged us to watch a horror knowing that we're both wimps, Andrew and I. And we've just watched Jordan Peele's directorial debut, Get Out. We've been meaning to watch it for a while and we didn't see it in the cinema and we haven't watched it till now because we are both wimps. But it wasn't scary, necessarily. I think we might have made a choice specifically geared so that we wouldn't ever actually be scared. We would bypass pop scares and we'd bypass Uh seriously tense moments Mm -hmm. and seriously bloody moments. So, screw you, Christy. (laughs) We, We got around your challenge by bending what counts as a horror film. I'm just looking at what various websites class it as genre-wise, mm. and they do say it's horror, so ha huh. It's got yeah. horror inflections, and there's a lot of shades of The Shining, and towards the end, I was thinking, is this going to go towards Night of the Living Dead, or is it just a hint that I'm picking up, but it actually mm. does the opposite of Night of the Living Dead. Maybe it's a reply to it, I don't know. But there's definitely yeah. quite a lot of shades of Kubrick in there. But yes, it's scary in a very different kind of way, I think. Scary in probably just how real embedded racism is, even in black people, which seems to be largely what it's actually about. So the white supremacist racism or the believing in the stereotypes and protesting too much. I'm not a racist, but I was getting those sorts of shades. but also how ingrained it becomes, the hatred of the self when you've been the oppressed, the legacy through history, when you've been an oppressed people, how that is erased and how you're assimilated into, I mean in this case it's how you're assimilated into white culture, white ways of life, white Mm. northern ways of life in the United States. You've been appropriated for other purposes, so it's slavery Mm. by another form. Yeah, I'm just in awe of how well that was done all together. That's how I take it up my praise if this movie's going to be. I'm just going to go, ah, it's so great. US and Canada box office, $255.5 million. Mm. Budget, $4.5 million. Wow. That is an astonishing amount. That's incredible. Amount. You can see the budget is on screen. It's a low budget, but the budget has been put into the mise-en-scene. It's really inventive cinematography. We were thinking the whole way through, you're learning things by what you're not showing. There's a lot of getting around things. There's a lot of in-camera effects to allow you to believe that you've seen something that you really haven't. So there's a lot of proper cinematic trickery in the best possible way and really, really resourceful use of the tools at their disposal. I would guess that certainly from the research I've ever done on Sally Potter, who works with very small budgets as well, maybe one, two million pounds, which is a similar kind of well used to be a similar kind of amount as dollars and the economic use of the budget it just puts me in mind actually of Orlando where you've got these huge sets elaborate costuming but a lot of time and energy went into rehearsals for weeks before and then they would get things in one or two takes and move on to the next location because it was all you see every penny on screen and you watch this and it's really high production value and I would not have guessed it cost so little to make this film. It's old school, it's intricately plotted. I would say that's clockwork plotting. Oh, it was right there. beautifully done, and I really was not seeing things coming. This is going to be half an hour of two white people praising a film made by some black people, isn't it? Sounding like, a little bit 
uncannily like some of the white characters in this book. Well, this is probably the point, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> it's made as much for us as it is for anybody else because that inverted kind of racism is so much a part of the problem, isn't it? Where you're protesting too much that you're not racist because of all of the black people that you can name and a lot of the characters do that. They see him and without missing a bay, it's, oh, do you like golf? Big fan of Tiger Woods. Really? Because he's a bit <laughs> problematic. <laughs> or it's just they named the one black person that they can think of that's broadly right, and this guy has no interest in these things. And the one person who, again, didn't see this coming, and it's so clever, the one person who takes an interest in Chris for Chris, and him as a photographer, is this guy Jim Hudson, the gallery owner who's blind. And it was played very well by Stephen Root, who yeah. tends to play the sinister characters. Uh-huh. Anyway, sorry? No, this? not at all. Massive spoilers in this one. The idea of the kidnapping, there's such a, like, black bodies as a commodity it's revisiting slavery very clearly and the literal use of the black body for ages you're thinking it's some kind of indoctrination or brainwashing or something it's even worse than that it's actually putting in a white person's brain into and taking over a black body that's revealed at about the was it one hour 45 ish minutes that's revealed at about the one hour 25 ish yeah. mark it's a big reveal. It's a really big reveal and it's actually, it's maybe I'm blind to this sort of thing, but certainly any of the reviews I ever heard or read said that there's something in it and it, you're not going to see it coming and I really didn't. Me neither. We've done our spoiler. I mean, mm, spoiler, yeah. which is... But the point is, is that the guy who wants his body wants him for his eyes so that yeah. he's actually been targeted specifically by somebody of this community, this family, as they call it. It's a really sinister spin on the idea of family. Family. Oh, and of course, yeah, you don't pick up on it till so later on. Georgina saying, I feel like part of the family. It turns out it is Rose's grandmother. Yeah. Really sinister. That it's packed with allusions to American horror films about insular communities that have cheated death in some way. There was a bit where I was thinking when Rose's father, who's, I think his name's ever said, but his name's Dean, was talking about how they're gods. I was thinking, what, what was this about? But of course what he means is they have the power to take an elderly person's brain and put mm-hmm. it into a younger person's body and yeah. in so doing give that person another 60 years yeah. of life. But also there's this idea of appropriation and it's a very white colonialist, neo-colonialist thing to do. There is a point made about this power of ornaments. I insists on taking Chris on the tour of the house and makes a point of showing him the pair of ornaments. Where were they from? It was somewhere in Asia, I think. Oh, I can't remember now. But yeah, so there's just this idea of pillaging and this is from this place and I love traveling. I travel all over the world. Mm. It's so great to experience other people's cultures and that kind of thing. And how many times have we heard you're a very wealthy, white, privileged person say those sorts of things to be able to go anywhere in the world because you have that kind of mobility and you have the money to do it to cherry pick bits of that culture and bring it back with you so that you always have that there's a deliberate that's set up for you that pillaging of other cultures but it's literally taking the people who are being abducted by this small community they're the descendants of people who were abducted from a continent and their bodies put to use through this unpaid labour and then it's just happening all over again in a different form in a more technologised advanced medical form. So it's important to point out that the moment when the film reveals that Chris, our main character, plays by Daniel... Daniel Kalua, I yeah. think it is, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. The bit where our main character, Chris, finds out that... Well, no, the bit where the audience and not Chris mm. yet, finds out that he has been auctioned, his body has been auctioned mm-hmm. to one of the members of this cabal, mm-hmm. this kind of extended family, because of a group that's called Behold the Coagula. That moment is really cannily done, mm-hmm. because it's intercut with a conversation that Chris and Rose mm-hmm. are having elsewhere on mm-hmm. the, might as well call it a plantation, elsewhere on the property. The auction's being carried out silently, so it's just Rose's mm-hmm. dad facing the camera doing stuff with his hands. And they're doing it with and bingo cards yeah, as and, well. Yeah, and so the people in 
his audience are holding up bingo cards. But there's the first few shots of him holding up his hands and pointing mm -hmm. and, and numbers of fingers and people holding up bingo cards. And those shots are all quite close into the people. Several of those shots are being intercut with shots of Rose and Chris talking mm -hmm. elsewhere, oblivious that this is happening. Slightly ominous music. The film had plenty of that. And only after the first few intercuts back and forth between these two scenes did the camera get sufficiently distant because yeah. it was always moving. And in these shots it was moving away from the characters. Did it get sufficiently distant to show that next to Rose's dad there was a framed photo mm -hmm. of Chris mm -hmm. to show that Rose's dad was auctioning mm -hmm. Chris. I wrote down that was at almost exactly the one hour mark of hour and 45-ish mm -hmm. minutes mm -hmm. and so it was past the halfway enough suspense had been built by that point that the film went okay we're now going to tell you one big thing about what's going on and then of course it had another big thing to tell us later on so yeah. in terms of having stages where it went okay you should be a little bit worried and now you should be a little bit more worried and now you should be quite worried and now basically you should worry about as much mm -hmm. as you've ever worried that was very neatly staggered across yeah. the whole film. and you look back on the film and it has warned you at every stage actually it has yeah. planted all the seats because this guy Jim Hudson he's sitting in the seats waiting everybody else is at the party having a great time he's sitting there already waiting for the auction. he's waiting for the auction you think oh he's just staying out of the party he's just chilling out but no he's done his research he knows exactly who Chris is maybe he's actually got them to seek him out we don't know that because it seems like so Rose is the daughter of this family who's grown up in this environment and she's charged with baiting. Both children are actually she and Jeremy but they both have very different approaches. His is very violent. Yeah. It's a very violent form of kidnapping whereas she is more of a seducer. She begins a romantic relationship with the person and draws them in that way. You have to give it to the film. In all of this telling us stuff that we would need to know later on and doing so with a lot of stuff and not telling us any stuff we didn't need to know later on. It's structured it quite neatly because in the pre credit sequence we had Jeremy wearing his knight's helmet, abducting the guy who later turned out to be Andre Hayward. Yes. He'd had the procedure done uh -huh. to his body by the time we met him. A so. man called Logan. Yeah. And it was simply, we don't see his face, this guy in a knight's helmet, he's got this white car and he's playing Run Rabbit Run mm. on his music system on the car. He just swipes this guy, Dre Hayworth, sticks him in his boot and then drives off. Mm -hmm. And that's the end of the pre credit sequence. That gets us ready to expect abductions by a guy in a car yeah. at night. Mm -hmm. And so the whole thing with Chris going to see Rose's parents, what we've been told to do is to not have any suspicions about yeah. that whatsoever. Yeah. And it's only really late on when Chris has managed to fight his way out of the Armitage mm -hmm. house. He just goes for a car and takes Je yeah. he's just beating the crap out of Jeremy he seems to have killed him takes his keys goes out gets Jeremy's car and sees well when he turns the engine on run rabbit run music starts mm -hmm. to play and he sees there's this knight helmet on the mm -hmm. passenger seat as well so it was a callback to something that had happened about an hour and a half earlier yeah, and they, yeah. a, a film that goes remember that thing that I told you yeah. and we told you about it well enough and clearly enough mm -hmm. ah, you're remembering that aren't yeah. you the character of Dre he's nervous walking around that neighbourhood it's a very well to do neighborhood and there's no people around it's totally it's barren almost of people and it's just this one car going past that's the only sign of any kind of human activity but it's a very Setford Wives looking area everything's very pristine and tidy and big houses and leafy avenues and he's on the phone with a friend voicing concern not feeling safe in this kind of neighborhood he's somebody who's from Brooklyn and he's not feeling safe then the car slows down it pulls up ahead of him he walks the other way the car stops he becomes aware that it has stopped when he looks back you know there's a lot of stuff going on behind people's backs quite a lot Jeremy manages to sneak up on him but he knows he's not safe his spidey sense is going off he knows he's not in a safe place whereas then that's the worst kind of it's a black widow kind of seduction that Rose is doing because she draws them in there's a false sense of security they've been together for four or five months they have this discrepancy between them about how long they've been together but he's really hooked he's really besotted with her and they build up trust it seems like the right time to think well I'm serious about this person and let's meet the parents and do all of that jazz now and so it's all been a long con he's lulled in it is an elegantly done con yeah and it's so violent I mean the thing with Jeremy it's obviously violent Dre knows there's a threat of violence he just knows this is gonna go badly for him and it's done quickly but then with 
Chris, it's so drawn out and the violence is so massive because it's that emotional investment that you put in someone for a long period of time and all of that coming crashing down and him really not believing that she could possibly be involved in something unsavoury until the very moment when she chooses to reveal it. When you and I were both going, do we think she's in on it? Maybe she's in on it. Yeah, course, suddenly she just switches and of course she's in on it. I was switching back and forth. He finds the shoebox full of the photographs of the previous conquests of hers I thought she's baiting them and then the character's such a good actress that you think oh maybe she's been hypnotised into doing this as well and I was back and forth when she was doing the look for the case and then it became so protracted and I thought oh no no she has to be acting and then she pulls out the key and she reveals that yeah she has been. For a film which ends with a lot of violence and it's not simply the kind of standard horror thing of here's someone who's a psychopath doing violent things to mm. victims. The all the violence it culminates with is the other way around. It's Chris having realised what's about to be done to him mm. and what's been done to so many black people before by this group mm. over decades. Him gritting his teeth and overtly killing three people in quick succession, indirectly killing another one, and then doing nothing to stop was his name Walter? Walter, yes. Although his, he, his name may not be Walter, whatever his yeah, original name was. He manages nothing to stop him killing Rose. He manages mm-hmm. to wake him up with the flash of his camera phone. That seems to be the trigger because the person isn't totally eradicated. There's still part of them in there. And he discovers this by accident because he recognises Dre, but he just can't get where he knows him from. He's presented as this guy, Logan, who is dressed like an old white guy <laughs> <laughs> with this woman who's 30 years his senior he can't picture it because this guy who when you see Chris's friend Rod doing the research looking into Dre and finding out about his disappearance it comes up on this screen on the search that he was a jazz musician so this is somebody again who it's not just that they're black people it's that they're very talented or they're very beautiful black people and there's a kind of master race and I think isn't it Dean during the tour he manages to shoehorn in all these different examples of things there's a crack about the Aryan master race it's actually the inverse of that they're doing they're creating this african-american master race inhabited by the brains of white people Exactly, yeah. yes. And that bit, I suppose, makes total sense, looking back. But mm. that bit where Rose's dad, Dean, is giving Chris the tour of the house and says, this is my dad, and he was... Or my granddad, was it? Mm. I think he says, this is my dad, and he was beaten by Jesse Owens mm. to the US Olympic squad for the Berlin Olympics mm-hmm. in 1930 something. And so there's this kind of inkling there of somebody having been made to live with the idea of being physically inferior to a black person Mm -hmm. in the States, in spite of being quite physically strong. We then later Mm -hmm. learn that that person's brain at least still exists and it's in the body of Mm -hmm. the gardener or groundsman Walter. Mm -hmm. And that explains why he's running at night. He just wants to use the fact that his body is still young and strong to, Mm -hmm. to do what he used to be able to do. And it's quite a threatening moment. That is a moment where your pulse does start to race. And Walter runs, he could have run anywhere, but he runs directly at Chris and then very suddenly veers off. So there is a deer in the headlights moment with that. We do spend a lot of time, and this is kind of foreshadowing, given that Chris is going to, the plan is that he's going to be taken and nearly killed for mm-hmm. his eyes. We just spend a lot of time looking at Daniel Kaluuya's eyes, mm. a gog. He's got quite big eyes, It's very it? expressive eyes, and, yeah. yeah and then being terrified. a photographer as well. It was really fascinating how they did the hypnotism. So Catherine Keener, and I can't remember her character's name. Miss- Missy, because I kept hearing her being referred to as Mrs. Armitage, and I'm wondering about the names as well, because it's Chris Washington, the Armitage family. There's just something about the names. Maybe that just needs a bit of further investigation, but there is something about, maybe it's to do with the plantations, that needs a bit of poking around at. With her doing the hypnotism, and it's the scraping of the teaspoon in a cup of tea, and the tapping. It's not even that it's just hypnotism, there's so much shaming in 
involved in it and there's so much of having someone almost drowning in their own trauma and being blamed and made to feel guilty and shameful for their own trauma for their own victimhood i suppose we have to explain here that the trauma we're talking about is missy in putting chris under without his consent that was really creepy she does it by starting a conversation with him about when he lost his mum when he was young she died in a car accident he was sitting at home just watching tv and it was raining and he didn't do anything when she was overdue Mm -hmm. he just waited and waited and waited and he feels his guilt because she didn't actually die in the car accident straight away she died later on Mm -hmm. he thinks that maybe if he'd called someone somebody might have found her but also an 11 year old child he's feeling guilt for something for which he couldn't possibly have been responsible so that's exploited to put him under and then when he's under I wrote down don't tell me that cinema can't do internal focalisation because it dramatises physically his psychological state in being hypnotised and it's done through having him sink into the floor and then sink further down into what seems to be this vast chasm Mm -hmm. of dark water and then we see point of view shots from him of what's above him and he can see a tiny little fuzzy screen screen. like like a TV screen yeah with what he can actually see out of his eyes Mm -hmm. on it and so when he's really deep really submerged he's looking up at this TV screen and he can see the armitages looking down and talking mm-hmm. to him. And then the extra violating of his autonomy is that he's then just put into his bed after that one mm-hmm. and persuaded that it's a dream. Mm-hmm. So that when he wakes up in the morning he goes, Okay, yeah, fine, didn't actually happen mm-hmm. and then has to find out later in the day that it did actually happen. Mm-hmm. I can see why I at least when it came to the moment where he starts to free himself, really close to the end of this film. There's no baggage there, there's no extra time at the end. There was no sense of really hurrying towards its conclusion no. that timed perfectly. When he starts to free himself, I find myself going, you mint those people as much as you want to mm. because they either violated you or were about to violate you in about every possible way. Mm. That moment, I suppose, where he goes to strangle Rose, mm. she's the last living person around him. And whoever was the original owner of Walter's body has shot her and has shot himself, just leaving Chris and then this Rose who's been shot, bleeding to death. Chris then goes to strangle her to finish her off, and he stops. And I did find myself, while he started strangling her, I found myself going, ooh, okay, this is just going to go all the way, isn't it? And then I went, ah, the film's deliberately made us think this, made us think, all right, so this is a guy strangling Mm -hmm. a woman who he's been in a relationship with. Mm -hmm. She didn't actually do anything physical to him, although she was part of the entire plan. She misled him. She was what he took him down in the first place. Mm -hmm. Would it be okay? But he clearly just decides, no, it wouldn't be okay. But then he does just leave her to death. Yeah, but it's the mirroring of how he described his mother being left to bleed to death. It's like he's able to forgive himself for that. There's a realisation, that was not my fault, this is not my fault. I'm the victim in both of these cases, so there is an acceptance. Maybe there's a silent acceptance of that victimhood. I was so anxious when I just kept thinking, I think I wrote it down, even even if he survives all of this, he's not getting out of this unscathed. He's got this house, this burning big house full of dead white people strangling his girlfriend while the sirens and the lights are going of what he thinks going to be a police car and even he knows my time's up he puts his hands up he thinks that's me I'm getting everything thrown at me here I'm not getting out of this it's done now and then it turns out to be Rod and you get these moments of comic relief but very incredibly well timed and Rod is because there were times with him I was wondering there's a scathing look at stereotypes of black people in general so the likes of there's a woman who said oh is it true about black men is it better meaning is sex better another woman feels his arms the physicality of a black man and the exoticized sexual fantasy of the other. There's also the little stereotypes like Chris is a smoker, he likes to smoke joints. His best friend is this really funny, quite foul-mouthed but very quick-witted fat guy. So he's like the jolly big best friend who's loyal to the bitter end sort of thing. But Rod is the total saviour of the piece because he's the only person who believes Chris. It's that thing of when you've got all this stuff happening and you're sure about what's going on and you feel like you're compiling evidence but then when you start to explain it to someone it just falls apart. Even to you it sounds unreasonable, it sounds crazy and I think anybody who's ever been in an emotionally manipulative 
relationship whether it's been romantic or with family members or in a friendship or with colleagues many of us will have experienced something along those lines where somebody's doing something that's driving you absolutely round the twist then you try and explain it to someone and as you try and explain it it doesn't sound logical or there's a reasonable explanation maybe you're overtired and oh you haven't had a cigarette for a while so maybe it's that there's a reasonable explanation so then you start to sound unhinged you're the problem and then you start to believe that you're the problem so there's a lot of that going on with him and Rod is the only person who believes him Rod himself becomes that person because he tries to go to the police and he goes specifically to black members of the police force he goes to one woman initially and then she calls in two other guys gets him to explain everything and he goes through his evidence and okay he could have been more robust in his presentation but you think with things that really do happen with violence it really does happen every single day in the United States to people with brown skin you'd think that they would believe each other but it shows you that embedded racism within your own because they just laugh because they just laugh at him Mm. they don't entertain it so he's on his own and so he comes to the rescue himself at the end and he's airport security so that's why he has a car that can have and he you know makes jokes well he doesn't make jokes but they come across as jokes to us because it's funny in his delivery that he's had even more detective training than the detectives you know (laughs) I mean he's just an ace character he's really fantastic so in a way he's that stereotypical funny fat black guy who's really full of mouths Mm. and has such a rhythm every other word is F but he has such a rhythm to it and he can say certain words that we can't say and get away with it so he's the kind of typical comic relief but there is substance to him there is a rounding of his character and he is not susceptible to Rose's manipulations he shuts Mm. it out he's able to it out. With lots of swearing. Yeah. That's his MO. For character development for Chris, this is one of the clockwork elements of this film. It doesn't go, hey, you know how there's this set of ways in which you can really involve your audience in the story. I'm not going to do any of those. Mm. I'm going to throw out the rule book and write my new one. He goes, see this rule book? I want to show you how awesomely I can do this entire catalogue of things that are part of the rule book. Mm. So this is one of those films that I would regard as completely fitting with David Bordwell's model of hyperclassicism in contemporary Hollywood cinema. Chris is changed for the better in his character. He becomes more confident mm. and then he becomes able to stand up to people who are manipulating him, able to just realise what's wrong and act on it immediately. Mm. he gets significant character development the film did a shameful amount of foreshadowing and they call it shameful just in the sense of I didn't realise that it was foreshadowing Mm. so the very first scene before the opening credits where Jeremy kidnaps Dre Hayworth that's only shot in two shots and the first shot is really quite close up Mm -hmm. to Dre and it's not showing you much in the background so that Mm. when Jeremy finally jumps in it's only jumping in from off screen space it's a fast reveal it moves around him doesn't it the camera is quite it's very mobile Mobile, it's moving around him so you do feel pretty disoriented you start to feel his anxiety at being in this neighbourhood and there's loads of that throughout the film mm-hmm. but then the second of those two shots in the opening sequence is a still extreme long shot of Jeremy who, the person we don't yet know is Jeremy but Jeremy dragging Dre unconscious back mm-hmm. into the car mm-hmm. sticking in the boot and then driving off yeah. and then about ten minutes later the first shot where we get to see Rose's parents and the shot where Chris also first gets to see them and meets them that's all shot in extreme long yeah. shot as well yeah. and it's one of those moments where the action would prompt someone according to habits to go oh you know this is about people meeting each other this needs to be filmed in singles doubles tight mm-hmm. shots but no it's a no we're just going to film this in extreme long shot mm-hmm. right there the film was saying to us what's happening here is exactly the same as what you just saw happening in that pre credit sequence even though it looks very yeah. different it's been shot with the same actually, camera distance the camera does start to pull back as well it does move it's static at first and then as they go into the house it very slowly pulls back there were so many shots where I thought this shot is interesting for many aspects of its content mm-hmm. but also because the cameras had been put on a very precisely choreographed move mm-hmm. as well so yeah. even just during conversations over mm-hmm. meals yeah 
for a specific line, the camera is going to be moving from here to yeah. here, and it's going to be pivoting this many degrees yeah. to the left while it's doing it. If you're doing that again and again and again when shooting it, you have to do the camera move mm -hmm. while the character says that line, going again and again and again. Well, that's why I think they probably rehearsed before they actually shot anything. Everything was really precise. What I was trying to say was it was pulling back, but then it reveals Walter yeah. watching over them. I forgot that bit, yeah. Yeah. At that point, he's just the groundskeeper. And then we know later the significance of that is that he's actually the orchestrator of all of this. Yeah, or at least the person who calls himself Walter, who was previously Roman Armitage, mm -hmm. in the body of whoever this, this is. Guy, There's yeah. kind of three identities. that The people who've been, we might call them Stepfooded. Yeah. Or they've been body snatched, whatever you want to call it. There's the identity, original identity of the person. So in the, in the case of the person who calls himself Logan King, he was originally Dre Hayworth. And then we learned with Roman Armitage, who presumably died 20 years ago, mm. that he's in the body of somebody who calls himself Walter, but we know that that's probably not his original name, so there's a third name out mm. there somewhere. And particularly with the fact that Dre Hayworth's name has been changed to King, that is, mm. I think at least, that is an allusion to slave naming. The idea that slaves would just automatically get the surnames of their own. So this changing of names all around alludes to these lost names. Mm. And of course the people who give Dre Hayworth back his name, at least in some sort of symbolic way other black people as a conspiracy for that yeah. name to have been erased. It's one legacy name being changed for another, certainly in his case. And I mean Chris Washington and mm. Logan King, these are specific names of prominent figures in US history. I can't remember Rod's surname, it was only said briefly once, I think, at the end. It's Williams. Williams, okay. Obviously, after we finish this, going to be looking mm. for the Cinema Sins Everything Wrong With version of this, because sometimes when the film's amazing, they do them, but they go, yeah, we're really scraping the bottom of the barrel with this one, because we couldn't find much wrong with this yeah. film. We really quite like this film, and they did like a two-minute version of it. With the hypnotism again, Missy calls it heightened suggestibility. And again, it's that idea of you convince someone that they are to blame for something that they're not to blame for. It's a mm. typical abuser trait as well. And then I suppose ways of saying, counteracting that. So there's suggestibility, the suggestion that you could see a situation in a different way or experience life in a different way. And she's putting them in the sunken place. That really reminded me, maybe it was the way it was done, but it reminded me of Under the Skin, the place where the Scarlett Johansson alien was taking mm -hmm. the men and sort of drowning them in this black sea. Just something about it, that idea of being sunk against your will, being drawn in, it's the gained consent. You've given consent to do this, but you've been persuaded over a long period of time or through a certain set of actions that you want to do this when actually if someone had just presented you with it you would see it for what it was so there's a long con constantly happening there the way she sends them into the sunken place but him being a photographer and him always seeing things through framings there's something as well he says that somebody says something about watching something on television and he said I haven't watched television since I was a kid because he associates it with the trauma of losing his mother because he was at home watching the television while she was dying in pain it's just something he can't do anymore but then they force him to watch screens they force him to watch television screens so his experience of being in the sunken place and his only view of real life is through a, what is like a television screen mm. he's trying to swim through the ether to get back to it but the more he fights the more he sinks away from it when he's trapped in the seems to be the basement they've got him bound to the chair he's set in front of an old television screen and this mm. film plays explaining to the person and then also to us what's really happening and that's also how he's repeatedly put under is that the cop will come on screen and climb three times and he'll go under. Normally I would see this sort of thing coming a mile off but I think it's a testament to how well constructed the film is. There's a motif as well, there's a visual motif of him when he's bound to a chair, him scratching. You first see it when he has the encounter in the middle of the night with Missy and she's starting to hypnotise him and he's grabbing at the arms of the chair and then there's the flashes to 11 year old Chris scraping the chair 
there with his nails waiting for his mother to come home yeah. and then that's mirrored again when he's bound to the chair. It seems to be in a games room, the place where you're kept yeah. to be prepared for the surgery. Because there's a dart board yeah. behind him. There's central framing. It's a very Kubrick room and it's shot in a very Kubrick way. It's yeah. centrally framed, wide angle lens so that it's bulging, it's distorted, it's unnatural feeling, it's symmetrical. There's this dartboard in the centre and then yeah. there's a double lamp, him in the middle, you know, his head is dead centre of the frame, that kind of thing. Virtually no movement of any subject. The camera can move and so it feels like the camera's dominating the subject. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very cute. There's that and then there's the chair dead centre in front of this very old television set that seems to have double speakers either side of the actual screen. It shows you his nails scratching and he scratched the leather off and the fluffy innards are starting to come out and you see him working through something and even at that it's so obvious what he ends up doing and when it reveals that he's used he's pulled this stuff out and somehow got it into his ears to plug his ears so he doesn't hear the clang anymore so he pretends to be out but he's not he's awake even that it's just like oh that's how you did it (laughs) It shows you everything and it blindsides you constantly. But I think that's the point, is that this is all going on in plain sight. We're seeing this every day. We're seeing this in front of us all the time. The embedded racism. We're just passively going along with our lives. This film is so cutting in every way. I mean, the construction of how that's done. While the credits were beginning to roll, I was reading a few accounts of alternative endings that Jordan Peele was playing with and even a couple that he actually filmed and one included that it was the police rather than Rod Mm -hmm. who picked him up at Mm -hmm. the end and another one was for an ending in which he doesn't escape it's a completely different ending where Rod rocks up the house and sees Chris and goes hey Chris what's going on and Chris says don't know who you mean but that apparently Jordan Peele said that he didn't go with the ending where Chris is picked up by the police and then Rod's one of the people who tries to get him out mm-hmm. and tries to explain what's been going on because he realised that there'd been a lot of consciousness raising yeah. during 2016 about police victimising of African Americans so he said he actually thought that he didn't need to help that mm-hmm. effort and so he thought it would be okay to not have to show that the police don't believe black people mm-hmm. ending in fiction It might have been overkill actually because there's already a scene of black cops not accepting what mm-hmm. a black man saying about another black man possibly being kidnapped in some sort yeah. of weird new type of slavery. It sounds so outlandish and yet it's perfectly plausible. He's already actually got that in there so it probably would have been overkill but that, I think it, that was what I was expecting and it was such a relief that they didn't go there and he's allowed to win the day yeah. and that's what was making me think actually because I was waiting for the police to turn up and for nobody to believe him and for him to just accept nobody's going to believe me. I was expecting is it going to be a night of the living dead? The black guy is the hero he gets through everything he's done everything right and yet he's just shot it's nice that it relents at the end and you get a sort of happy ending in a way he survives and somebody believes him there's this solidarity between the friends and that hopefully they'll rebuild something I would say it was probably the right call it's nice to see somebody who's been resourceful and worked it out surviving I was thinking to myself did this have to be so about race Couldn't there have been some way of getting into fiction the idea of a less racially conflicted America or a less less racially conflicted equilibrium at the ending than they had at the beginning? And I ultimately thought, no, that's not something which people who are aware of what racial tensions are like in the US are ready to imagine. I think we don't realise the extent of it. We do have that here in the UK, but it's nowhere close. It's not even touching what seems to be going on in America at the moment. We've been watching the new Sasha Baron Cohen, who is America, lately. You know, I'm fully aware that there's likely to be contrivance because otherwise I really do worry for his life. So in a way, I hope there's contrivance in who they get on the show, but a lot of the people they do get we know are real because they're politicians. 
their profiles are out there. To see them being really quite genuine in their racism, their misogyny, their homophobia, their transphobia, their program attitudes, it really is terrifying. It's timely. Having seen The Rape of Reese Taylor, in that film they described the black films of the period when the KKK was very visible, it was actively enacting an intense amount of violence on people and the, these race films were being made by black people for black people so that they had an outlet for their stories because no one else was believing them or listening to them so they could at least see themselves and know that we're not making this up, this is happening to us. It felt like it's taken far too long for all of this to happen but it feels like it's now safe to make a film like Get Out to make a point. And I think it is pointed that look, this is a film for white people. That white people need to see this because it's white people who have made black people racist against each other. It's what our ancestors have done to their ancestors that has caused this. There is a collective culpability here. That was even iterated in this film at the level of stylistics because I kept thinking to myself during about the first mm. two thirds of the film I kept thinking everyone looked gold there's lots of people being shot early in the morning or late in the evening there's lots of people being shot with the sun behind them lots of diffused light and lots of making sure that when you're shooting people with dark skin that you don't make their skin look all the same colour and you do that by making sure that you use light sensitivity settings that are specific to different skin tones rather than just using the mm -hmm. light sensitivity setting specifically for white skin and changing that for each character which involves lots of not shooting two people in the same frame mm -hmm because it's quite difficult to yeah. get all the different shades in a single person's skin when they're right next to somebody who's got much lighter or much darker skin. So it was like that for the first two thirds of the film and then suddenly the bit when the Armitages turn out to just all be psychopaths, mm. everything just stops being gold. Yeah. Suddenly it's, the light suddenly becomes a lot bluer mm -hmm. and they all start to look a lot whiter. Mm -hmm. And particularly Rose when she picks up a phone call from Rod on Chris's phone. And she's wearing white. And she's wearing white and her hair's tied back mm -hmm. and her skin, it looks like she's had her skin bleached. She's and quite she looks significantly whiter. Mm -hmm. Sit in the moonlight, even at the level of lighting, mm -hmm. that this, okay, a bit crap, but seeming idyll of racial equality mm -hmm. that we've been telling you about for the first half of this film, I think you've probably worked out now. Mm -hmm. It's a complete facade, and we'll now show you the way the conflict works, and it's going to be a stark, mm -hmm. terrifying environment. And yeah, cars. in a way, it's making this huge comment about slavery where these people were seen as base and as no better than animals that's how you keep somebody down when you think these are the elite but we don't want them to know that they're the elite so we're mm. going to make them feel like the lowest form of creature and do everything for us because we can't do it ourselves because we're a bit rubbish actually but they can do it because they've got this physicality it feels like it was a huge comment about right back to the origins of slavery because there's this question of why are you specifically targeting black people. Even the only other person who isn't white is the old Japanese guy who corners Chris and asks him this really huge weighty question about being an African American, what that means today. Why do you expect one person to represent all of this kind of person just because that's what his skin looks like? So back to the idea of the like a master race, it's this idea of the white people thinking my body's not good enough, their bodies are perfect, that's exactly what I want, I want that physicality, I want what they have, I'm taking it for myself. It's that taking of the bodies again. And then there was a point where when Rose had Rod on the phone and it was clear that she was going to start to try and manipulate with him. And I couldn't really help thinking, but where is this going to go? Because would anybody actually want him? Because I think they've maybe specifically chosen. They've got a fat character who wears glasses and is a bit of an idiot. Is he really desirable in this new master race? she's just messing with him because it never progresses there's no evidence either way for that kind of claim but yeah you have to wonder because when you see the photographs and the people that you do see in this family this extended family they're all thin they're all attractive they've got strength 
they've got speed, they've got agility and I think the thing with Georgina is she's constantly doing her hair, she's constantly preening herself she's concerned with her appearance she's looking in the mirror and it's because I don't know if we ever get the name but presumably that's the grandmother of the family yeah. which is actually never really revealed but it's implied when you find out that Walter is Roman Armitage and she's constantly admiring her appearance you never hear her voice or anything you just see her in the images the photographs the mm. video that Chris is made to watch and she's a little white woman so she's constantly admiring her thin beautiful young body he pointed out as well that because they've had this brain surgery there's the massive scarring on the head so the men are wearing hats and Georgina's wearing a wig so her constantly preening her hair it's not even all black people it's the physical elite of black people as seen through Mm. the eyes of the white people there's lots of nicknames for new forms of racism I suppose, so I suppose this one would be the racism of unrealistic bodily expectations, the racism of deeming people to be no more than their bodies, albeit by praising them, the racism of envy, racism of unreasonably high expectations. There's, it's kind of a mixture mm-hmm. of all of these things. That bit very early on where Rose is saying to Chris, so we're going to go and see my parents this weekend, are you sure? You want to do this? And Chris goes, do they know I'm back? Mm-hmm. And she, she goes, look, look, then my parents are not racist. I would have told you if they are. It's that kind of, okay, right, we can just set that aside now. And in the sense of regarding black people as being uniformly inferior to white people in every way, she's right. They're just a different sort of racist. You know, they've got a new brand. I might call this one of those films where the medium by which the story is being transmitted to the viewer, what I often call a narrating principle or a narrative mm. process, is at certain points in this film just about tangible enough to call it a narrator. Because it's, you know, it's not a, it's no one talking, there's no character doing voiceover narration, it's none of that. But it's a really quite stalky camera mm-hmm. at certain points. Mm-hmm. It's a narrator who's focalised in our main white characters, in spite of also being focalised in Chris, our main character. There's even, I was noticing in the background actors at this party, they're always staring at him, they're always looking at him. And the women, quite in a comedy sort of way, they think, oh, he's gorgeous, he's alright, that kind of way. And even when they're out of focus, they're always looking towards him. And then he's always looking as well, so his camera, he uses his long lenses of his camera to probe, to see further, to try and investigate. And also there's subjectivity in the sound on occasions there was a moment with Georgina you get the sense that sometimes her actual self is almost going to override Mm. the person who's taken over as if that surgery maybe wasn't as successful as the other ones Chris says masked hostility Mm -hmm. it's like he's getting this feeling that the other black people he's encountering don't want him around there and then he thinks at first that it's to do with Rose that maybe they're a bit precious about her and he can't figure out what exactly it is and he's feeling like they're being too nice they're being fake nice to me and I can't figure out why they don't really want me around here and it's because there's this tug of war that we don't realize going on inside these minds is there's two minds in one body and one is screaming get out of here save yourself kill me and the other is this white person who's been transposed into them trying to go about things and try and get him to stay because they want him to become one of them there's this push and pull constantly happening there's moments of slippage with Georgina where the sound when she's pouring out drinks when she's pouring out Chris's drink she goes somewhere in her mind it's almost as if something else takes over the sound starts to blur she loses her way she becomes a bit shocked and then when there's a confrontation between Georgina and Chris because he's realised that she's been unhooking his phone from its charger and he has no charge ever there's this override you can see the override the acting's just incredible from everyone because they're doing this double thing this double performance it must have taken weeks of preparation of getting this right because tears are coming from her it's as if tears are being pushed out of them from something deep inside I don't know how they achieved that but it's incredible and she's telling him with her eyes you need to go you're not safe here I want you to go because this isn't okay but then everything else about her 
it overrides the new programming takes over and you get the laughter you get the smiling the very wide eyes and the override so you'll get this flash in the eyes of you need to leave you're not safe and then it'll be overridden by this happy oh everything's lovely here that bit do you remember that little confrontation between Georgina and Chris mm. when she goes okay everything's fine and she turns around and leaves she leaves way too fast yes it's perfect little touch it's sped so up yeah and there were so many things like that of her sneaking somewhere and it's really fast and doesn't make a sign it's almost like she's floating there's that horrific element of that there's something spectral about her and of course she is a ghost in a way they all are because they're this husk of a person they're a dead body walking around i'd quite happily say that this is one of those great examples where everyone involved in screenwriting and directing everyone's realized that there are traditions galore within lots of genres and that the way in which one does something new is not by going i'm going to abandon every single tradition i'm going to move outside of every single type of story that's ever been made they're going to desperately try and come up with something new that's not the way you do it what you do is you take something that has already been done that audiences will be at least mildly familiar with and you just do it in a way where some of the contents is new and you shoot it and stage it in a way that is at least relatively original so you know, some of the environment looked a bit like mm-hmm. bits from the Stepford Wives. Fine. So there's, there's, there's Stepford Wives precursors mm-hmm. there. There's Kevin Smith film called Red State as well came mm-hmm. to mind. Texas Chainsaw Massacre also mm-hmm. came to mind. But the people's brains being transplanted into bodies, who, but the original owner of the body still has a bit of their brain left, mm-hmm. so they're in there somewhere. Yeah. That element, I've not come across anything like that. No. Before, so there's some good original. There. And it's the fact that that originality is a challenge to expectations that have been planted by other aspects of the film that are not original. Mm. Well, I don't mean this in a derogatory way, you know, they're not original in the sense of they call back to earlier films. That difference is part of the big reveal at the end of the film because the expectations that have been marshaled by those familiar patterns earlier on are the ones that are, that are frustrated. Right? Yeah. So if you didn't have those original elements, it wouldn't be such a big reveal. I know that we do our best to try and remain neutral on quality, or even though we don't have to, but I think today we've just given them and gone. This was a tasty a film. Solid film, solid, solid filmmaking. Well, um, given that it made something like 2,000% profit, I'm going to even go a little, bit, <laughs> a little bit better than solid clockwork. It does set another thought about Georgina because the reveal in the photographs in Rose's room is that Georgina was one of those earlier conquests. There's this implication that they'll go to any lengths. Who even is Rose? She seems to have just been born and bred. Both she and Jeremy seem to have just been born and bred. He comes across as really unhinged. She's just really erratic and violent. There's something a bit... There's this controlled low-level violence in him when he is just... There was something of Alex from The Clockwork Orange about him for me. But with Rose, you know, she's the sweet, bubbly, accepting person. It's just a very quick moment. But the idea that there's this long string of men and then right at the end the last photograph is Georgina so mm-hmm. what does that say about sexuality what does that say about what these people are, what lengths these people are willing to go to in one way it's like this over acceptance of something it's not heteronormative mm-hmm. but just because there's one woman in there it doesn't mean she's bisexual either she's clearly acted with everybody so it's all a performance but it's this super acceptance so you ha- I mean the film that that would have been where it's Georgina being the bait and not just as the black person but that it's a lesbian relationship so we're imagining that it's not just all of the I'd have voted for Obama a third time it's not just that it would have been all the token lesbian stuff you could think of as well as a sort of like oh and I'm a huge fan of so and so you know we love Ellen DeGeneres in this house you know something like that like it's just imagining that it would be the race and the sexuality in her case and it would go too far and protest too much it's very very subtle but it is in there there was even one point which I was very excited to notice where there seemed to be on the wall of Rose's room there seemed to be an album cover by Criss Cross 
Do you remember Criss Cross? Mm -hmm. um, and it seemed to be called Something Is Dead. Disco is dead. And you said it looked, if you took the disco off, it would look like Chris is dead. Yeah. And we were like, oh no, <laughs> poor <Jenny>. Chris. <laughs> but, Clearly something's going wrong. Yeah, but I think they're probably having fun with the mise en scène. So detail on the mise en scène. Yeah. Extreme skill in cinematography, colour range. I didn't mind at all that the, the incidental music was quite conspicuous. Mm. Quite Overt, fine, it's a horror film. Plot, very tight, character development, plausible, even in a slightly sci fi situation. I have just found that everything wrong with has done everything more than get out in 15 minutes or less. Mm. So I'm probably going to go and see whether I agree with them on them having some criticisms of this film. But at the moment, we have none that spring to mind. That was good. Are we wrapping up? I don't know. As Rod put it, I won't say it exactly as he put it, but I will say situation handled, but not really, because <laughs> this is still a massive problem. But yeah, situation for now, for this podcast, very much handled. Best up. <laughs> <laughs> Great radio. Many thanks for listening. If you have ideas for future topics or would like to be involved in a recording, you can email audiovisualcultures at gmail.com, tweet at avcultures and find our Facebook page also at avcultures. Take care for now and catch you next time.